Um, I hope you won't, won't be bored because there's bound to be some repetition. However, I think this is completely correct because the future is made by many people doing many things in many different places. The challenge is, of course, to follow the same main path. And this is what the Universal Agenda uh, 2030 is supposed to be doing. And I hope that maybe we'll, we'll come to a bit more practical level. We will have to implement 2030, all of us, together. No more us and them. And as Ambassador Boga pointed out, we could be the generation that can actually put an end to hunger. We could pull it off. One central stakeholder in this work is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, or as we all say, more or less aff affectionately, FAO or FAO. And in spite of only agriculture making it into the name, forestry and fisheries are very much part of the organization. And at this point, we'll see if this, oh, this works, yes. You see this here? You might wonder, Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation, are we not talking agriculture, forestry and fisheries? Yes, we are. They are sectors of the Swedish economy. And since the elections in 2015, the government made a, uh, a solemn vow to decrease the level of unemployment in Sweden to the lowest level of the European Union. And one way to do this was to get all sectors of the economy into one and the same uh, ministry. So thus the ministry, former Ministry for Agriculture, then Ministry for Rural Development is now integrated into the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation, which is now a super ministry with four ministers. So rest assured, we still have a minister for rural development. And as you can see, basically all states in the world are members of the FAO. We have two observers. This is the Pharaoh and the little island of, if somebody knows this, I'm going to be very impressed, Tokelau. And the reason for the EU flag being there is that FAO is the only UN organization of which the EU is a member. It doesn't have any special, it is a member. And you can see this is new members 2013, which is quite some time ago. It's because there are no more states to become members. The last ones were Brunei Dar es Salaam, Singapore and South Sudan. Well, of course, if there are more countries that, uh, that uh, come into being, they might become members. So I can say one thing, as a member, what you commit to, besides taking an active part in the organization, is also to share your statistical data, which made some countries hesitate, which is why Russia was a quite a late incomer into the FAO. Um, let's look at some history. FAO predates the UN by a couple of months. It was instituted on October 16th, 1945 in Quebec, Canada. Then it moved to Washington DC to find its permanent home in Rome in 1951. It could easily have been Switzerland, Denmark or New York because Italy only won by two votes. And as Professor Magnusson showed us, this. This nice building here is the former colonial ministry of Mussolini. <laughs> However, it's very conveniently located because it's right in the center of Rome by Colosseum and has its own underground station. So it's very helpful for us who work there. Uh, and it celebrated 70 years last year. And I just put in the basic text here because this is the constitution of the FAO. That is what tells us how the organization should be run. The picture in 1945 was much less complicated than what we see today. But of course then countries took less of a global interest than they do today. That's as we've heard from ambassadors Bolga and Olvsgård. Uh, so it was so easier. FEO was the place to go to. Forestry, fisheries, agriculture, that was FEO. Time has gone by. We've gotten many more stakeholders to become active and with several new perspectives, environment, poverty, equality, nutrition, etc. 
But unfortunately, as Ambassador Borger reminded us, the questions largely remain the same. We still have poverty and hunger to an unacceptable degree. And well, you can see G7, they put food security very high on the agenda. We now have foundations which are pull a big power, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for instance, just one of them. And of course, we have the many NGOs and CSOs as well. The world is also very complex. Here, this is supposed to show the growing obesity epidemics. We have the climate change. We have the waste. You can see here in the uh, industrialized developed countries, the red denotes the uh, food loss and waste that happens after we've reached the consumer. And here in the developing countries, you can see most food and loss and waste is between the field and the consumer. But as I said, the sit hunger situation has improved. There are 167 million less people starving compared to the year 2000. But there's still almost 800 million who cannot eat their fill and go to bed hungry. One billion live on less than $1.25 a day which is about 10 kroners a day. But overall, the share of malnourished in developing countries has gone down from 23 to 12. Here on the lower map, you can see, as I think uh, somebody mentioned already, the green countries are the countries that have been able to celebrate fulfillment of Millennium Development Goal number one of halving the number of starving. But also, as pointed out, the red ones have not, because usually man-made catastrophes have stopped them. And you can see that sub-Saharan Africa is, of course, very uh, hard hit. And I'd like to re-emphasize what Professor Magnuson said. If women had access to the same kinds of resources as men, 150 million people, less people, would go hungry. And this. This, I think, is actually fact, because it's been calculated by FAO. So, <laughs> there are 795 million hungry people in the world, but also 600 million obese people. Obese means that your body mass index is above 30, i.e. somebody as tall as myself, 165, would weigh 82 kilos, which would be normal weight for somebody who measures 180. In fact, 2 billion worldwide are fat. 39% of all adults are fat and 13% are obese. 42 million children are either fat or obese. It is a personal worry of, of, my, of my own that as the obesity con epidemic concerns so many more countries today and in the future, and that the cost to both the individual and society at large Starving people concentrated in a few countries will come at a lower priority. I hope it won't happen, but... Back to FEO. As the organization grew, there's been many calls for reform. About 10 years ago, many of the members felt uncertain of the organization's added value to global work. Even more so, since for many years, FAO seemed to have taken the Wallenberg family's motto as its own, esse non videri, to be, not to be seen. Experts, consultants, and universities relied to a large extent on FAO information and statistics, but this was not communicated to governments. This low profile, together with little FAO management development since three decades, led to agreement on having a thorough, independent, external review done. The pile of document was about four or five centimeters thick. The result of this re really thorough review was that if FEO did not exist, it would have to be reinvented. And this provided a foundation for elaborating a reform plan, which has been called the most thorough in the UN system. The management and member states cooperated for the first time in such a work. And as Ambassador Olof Skord said, I think this is one of the key things. There's been a new way of working. 
we always sort of say all the stakeholders, but this is true. Member states work cooperatively with global organizations and with the rest of society, which is new and which is really fabulous. The result was what we called the immediate plan of action with 254 measures identified along with who was responsible for what. These measures have now been implemented, barring a few, actually most on governance, for which the member states were responsible. And in this, I'm, I'm, I'm like Professor Magnusson, I'm Swedish, I want to complain a little bit. One of these measures that we strongly wanted to see was uh, a list of desirable qualifications for the Director General in the basic texts, so that each country who wanted to field a candidate could see what other countries would look at to evaluate the candidates. Because all countries can field competent people. So, um, but we did not manage. But small success, somebody else all of course will know all about this, is a small success. It's not being cancelled, deleted, it is just parked. So we hope we'll come back to that. And Oh, sorry. No. There. I pressed the wrong button. Here you can see it's this culture change, which sounds kind of fuzzy dozy, but it was a fact that at FAO, people working in what we call silos. So if you were dealing with forestry, you'd never talk to anybody in fisheries because they wouldn't understand anything. So the whole culture needed to be changed so that people work together in a more modern way, in project group for different um, projects, programs. So, from the basic constitution, FAO has always had three main goals. So, eradicate hunger, eliminate poverty, and sustainability. They are very big. So, in the reform plan, five strategic objectives were identified, which were five help eliminate hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition. I mean, it serves no purpose if you have the right number of calories, if it doesn't contain all the things that you need. Um, two, make agriculture, forestry, and fisheries more productive and sustainable. Reduce rural poverty. Enable inclusive and efficient agriculture and food systems, because you know this is a whole chain that has to hang together to be able to achieve what we want to achieve. And five, very, very important, increase the resilience of livelihoods to threats and crisis. So, which means that if you've gotten to a good situation, you really need to think about what are the risks? If something happens, should the locusts come this year, will I be totally wiped out or what can I do? And this risk management has now grown and is much better understood. The African Union, is working very hard with the African risk capacity. So the systems are being put in place, but it takes some time. And this is to recognize that hunger and poverty, as stated, must be attacked at several fronts if the result is gonna be sustainable. And this little thing down here, which is very colorful, is to show the complex matrix organization that FAO has now adopted in place of the silos. We will have to see what the structure can deliver and if it has served the purpose of breaking down walls. I think they're on their way, but we still need to look at that. Now we come to FEO and the Sustainable Development Goals. FEO has actively promoted the whole process. They have, uh, among other things, they have worked and continue to work very hard on the indicators. And after the consensus among member states on the SDGs, FEO did a preliminary mapping of their strategic objectives and SDGs and saw that there's close alignment between the two. The organization sees a role for it in providing evidence-based and comprehensive policy advice. I think that's something that Professor Magnusson also mentioned. Implementing programs, supporting the monitoring of progress, developing capacities, strengthening the institutional environment and building partnerships and alliances. And this, of course, is not new material. This is what they have been doing, but it gives them an added impetus to continue and to enlarge these, um, this uh, work. 
and the organization expects the next two years to be a transition phase, focusing on national efforts to prioritize goals and targets, which also Ambassador Olsgaard said, developing plans and partnerships, and mobilizing financial and non-financial means of implementation. And the FAO decentralized offices are gearing to maximize their effectiveness in supporting countries with the implementation of the SDGs. FAO, as I said, is also fully engaged with what is known as the interagency expert group in developing a monitoring framework and selecting the SDGs indicators. As we've said, FAO is headquartered in Rome, where it has the bulk of its expertise. Through a network of national and regional offices, it maintains close contact with the field. It should be noted that FAO always works with the government and the resources available to offices outside Rome are to act as seed money to get other stakeholders on board and involved. And going through the SDGs, FAO picked out eight for closer work. And we'll go through them and get some examples of activities area for area. And you will note through this expose activity that most, if not all, are cross-sectional. No poverty. 80% of the world's extremely poor live in the countryside. Good linkages between the country and the city are important, especially as urbanization is accelerating in developing countries. Even though most people in Africa and Asia still live in the rural areas, they will not in about 14 years. 2009, we passed the critical point where more we're living in cities than in the countryside. So who's going to feed the cities? How should the food be produced? And income for rural populations must be boosted, in particular for women and... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not very good at this technical thing. And which is this project uh, in Africa that we're targeting women and youth, same as agri -fosse. Yeah, And... Here, the darker blue areas are where there's a concentration of rural poor per square kilometer. And this is what I'm saying, if you can get rid of poverty and hunger in China and India, then there'll be very few countries left. And they are moving at a very, very fast rate. So. Zero hunger, number two. This is what we've been talking about a lot. I smile a bit when I saw that it was called Zero Hunger because I don't think it's a coincidence that it's called Zero Hunger. The then candidate for presidency in, in Brazil, Luis Inácio or Lula da Silva, launched the Zero Hunger Project, a, a proposal for food security in Brazil in October 2001. And uh, the FAO's present director general has written a book about this. So the concept was then adopted by the secretary general in 2012 launching the Zero Hunger Challenge that has all, had already been going on in Latin America for quite a number of years. So we have the same questions again. How can food production continue with most people living in cities? Uh, we have international years here to put the focus on different aspects. We've had the International Year of Quinoa. We had family farming. Last year, it was the International Year of Soils. So, and somehow, people sometimes tend to forget that fertile soils is a prerequisite for growing anything at all. And this year is the year of the pulses. And also, FEO tries to broaden our diet. They identify and try to communicate uh, what could be good for us. Here, they suggest that cactus pear, common buckwheat, yam, bean, breadfruit, Oka and Cardoon are good nutritious crops that we could try. And here we have insects, which is the next best source for protein, as they use much less resources than livestock raising does. But I can tell you it will be a tough sell in Sweden. I was at a very interesting seminar at CEDA, where we got that for, instead of cinnamon buns, don't think there were many insects eaten there. <laughs> Responsible consumption and production. And here you can see that it is good to uh, focus on youth 
because they learn quickly and you have time to really instill um, sustainable agriculture in their minds. And here in Bangladesh, we come back to the city, uh, these street sellers have been taught how to minimize food contamination during preparations and how to use their new and improved uh, food carts. And of course, FEO always works in conjunction with many stakeholders. So there's a local NGO working in this project and also a local school. So to see that it's actually working, that the, the, s the street sellers are respecting the hygiene rules. So life below water. And FAO, of course, researches the facts about aquaculture, aquaculture and disseminates them. There are quite a few um, misconceptions when it comes to aquaculture, and it's very important to dispel them, because as you might know, uh, the growth of fish um, harvesting is in aquaculture, because we have, um, we have almost depleted all the natural stocks. Uh, it keeps track of the fish trade, a state of fish stocks, it offers an area, uh, a forum for international agreement on, for instance, illegal and unregulated fishing. There are over 200 nations trading in fish, and one of the greatest difficulties fish exporters face is dealing with the different requirements of health and quality standards in various markets, and FAO tries to facilitate solutions. Clean water and situation. The, uh, I think it might be, where am I already? 15. No. Well, that was, that is Lam. Ah, yes, I should not skip things, so that's true. Um, so FAO creeps track here of forests. You can see the, the dark areas is where deforestation is larger than replanting. It's quite interesting. And here, uh, Professor Magnusson will be very happy to know that back to practices will lead to better lives for these ducklings as well as a better income for the farmer. And I hope they're not transported around because this is in Vietnam, as you were talking about. <laughs> And also how to grow mushrooms smarter, helps rural livelihoods. And combating disease for animals and plants is a very important task. And of course, FEO works with both the Organization for Animal Diseases, OIE, and WHO, because as we know, things move very fast and can move from human to animal and the other way around. And FEO is uniquely placed to get regional cooperation going. And I can say one very tangible result of such a cooperation is the declaration in 2010 that rinderpest has now been eradicated. It has been a very, very difficult problem. Ah, here we have the clean water and sanitation. And here this is a very interesting um, a document from FEO because you know water is a scarce resort in many countries. And what does it mean for the rural poor? And this map, the greener areas, shows the possibilities. If you could manage water well, what that would mean to the rural poor. And this aqua crop is a very interesting software that you can use to do uh, multiple simulations to see how your uh, harvest could be with different types of water and irrigation. And affordable and clean energy. In the context of the EC-funded project Strengthening of Livestock Services in Angola, FEO is working on the installation of solar fridges for storing vaccines based on an innovative technical solution that avoids the use of batteries to store electricity and of photovoltaic systems intended to power existing cold storage, uh, cold storage room for vaccines because you know that's one of the big problems in, in um, tropical countries. And these systems can also be used to power off-grid rural veterinary centers that serve small-scale livestock herders, which will be part of your project as well. And FEO has also put together a package for how to analyze your situation when it comes to bioenergy, how to make decisions about using and producing. And this list I just copied um, from the FAO website because it gives you a list of all the areas that are impacted by energy. 
And finally, climate. Um, and if you analyze this, the risk for food security when the climate changes, loss of rural livelihoods and income, loss of marine and coastal ecosystems and livelihoods, loss of terrestrial and inland water ecosystems and livelihoods, food insecurity, and the breakdown of food systems. And this is, this is a source book for agriculture to underline that sustainability requires an integrated approach that is specific, as was also said, to local conditions. And coordination across agriculture sectors, crop, livestock, forestry, and fisheries, as well as with other sectors as energy and water sector is essential to capitalize on potential synergies, reduce trade-offs, and optimize the use of natural resources and ecosystem services. And one thing that, we, that Ambassador Olskor also said, how will we know when we have achieved all the dimensions of, for instance, um, SDG 2? This is working project. I just copied this to show the enormous amount of work that is being done by the expert group. And you can see that there are discussions. First, the uh, indicators started out as yellow. Many ended up as green after the latest meeting. Uh, however, there are still some what are, is called gray indicators, and there are now a new meeting, so that we hope they will all become green. And it's the UN Statistical Commission that is guiding this work. And as you will have noticed, it is difficult to place activities in one certain box. This further reinforces what we've said, that we need to progress on all SDGs in order to measure improvements in one SDG, such as SDG 2. Hoping that I've managed to convey something of the magnitude of the challenge before us, thank you very much for the opportunity.